moment, we'll have some polls come up on Zoom that you guys can interact with. And we'll show you two designs, uh, which is like, they'll be the same design, but they're designed differently. And you can kind of try to pick which one you think intuitively feels better. And there's, it's not really to test you or anything. It's mostly just to explain um, different elements of design uh, through like these examples. So, yeah. All right, so I'm going to send out a poll. Uh, for everyone and you will vote A for option A and B for option B, whichever design you think is better. And I'll give you guys about, let's say, 30 seconds. Or until everyone votes. <laughs> It's also okay if you guys don't know, just take your best guess. If you don't know, that's what this uh, workshop is for, for this event. Okay, so it's been about 30 seconds. So I will show you guys the right answer or the correct answer. Um, and that is going to be option B. Uh, so, uh, as we can see, visual hierarchy can be created by manipulating uh, any of the design elements, which it can include the typography, the space, the shape, the size, or the color. And so in this example, we really focused on the contrast of color, um, showing how uh, you can easily like identify an object based on like, the differences. So it'll be easily recognizable at first glance. So these were the results. Um, everyone seemed to do a really good job. Um, and so I will stop and we will go to the next one. <clears throat> and so again, same rules, A for A and B for B. And you just pick whichever one you think is the best. Um, okay. That's my bad, sorry guys. Well, you saw the answer now, but don't cheat if you can try Yeah, maybe you to. could just like pretend you didn't see. Maybe you <laughs> pretend didn't. you didn't see that. <laughs> Okay, oh, we have some more coming in, but I'm going to end the poll in about five seconds if anyone wants to get their last minute answers in. All right, okay, so I'm going to share the results. So as we can see uh, from the results, everyone thought A was the best, was more, or a majority of people thought A was the most accurate, and if we go to the results, um, we will see that they were right. So uh, this kind of goes around the idea of search placement. Um, if the primary action uh, like on the map was to search for something, it's better to place it on the bottom of the screen as it's more reachable to the user. So if you've noticed in the latest iOS drop, um, they've changed their user experience by placing the search button on the bottom of the screen versus at the top of the screen for the Safari browser app. And I know that's made things a lot easier for me because my phone is a little bit bigger and I have smaller thumbs and so I can't really reach all the way. So I personally think that it's been a big help. So that's, we'll go on to the next. So again, same deal. I'm sure you guys understand now, A for A, B for B. This one's a little bit trickier, I think. Maybe not. All right. Um, the answers have stopped, so just get your last minute answers in. I'll give you guys five more seconds if you want to answer. All righty. So as we can see from the results of the poll, a majority of the respondents picked B, and you guys are right. This kind of goes again, goes across uh, the idea of Fitz Law, which is the that the principal states that the time to acquire a target is a function of the distance to the side to and the size of the target. So likewise, the distance between the user's task and attention area and the related button should be kept as short as possible. So this basically says that overall touch target should be large enough for the users to accurately select them and be spaced around uh, according to the targeted outcome. So as you can see from option B, the continue button is above the cancel button. So in the terms of hierarchy, is 
it's showing that the continue button is better versus cancel and you uh, it is also highlighted more so moving on to the next one There we go. Same deal. A for A, B for B. This one is tricky, I think. Yeah, and for this one, if you can't tell the differences, it's the your and mine, the start your free trial. I I know it takes a while to pick that up, but yeah. It's kind of like a spot the difference uh, activity that you would see in magazines a lot, or like find the separate differences <laughs> all right i'll give five more seconds if anyone wants to give it the last minute answer all right so um, a majority of people ended up picking b which uh was right and so this deals with the user's point of view um a first person uh point of view helps uh helps the user kind of feel more reassured in their choices and it creates a more relational tone. Um, some studies have actually shown that uh, using first person rather than second person in your button copy has increased your conversion rates um, considerably. So up to probably about 90% for your click-through rate, which is huge if you're a data marketing person like myself. So, all right, on to the next. You guys are doing a great job and all right. So again, A for A, B for B. This one, again, is kind of tricky, but it revolves around a text alignment. All right, five more seconds. Okay, so I'm going to share my, the results again, and you guys did great. A majority said A, and you guys were correct. So as you can see, you wanted to, you want to align the text in the most legible way. Uh, the text element should really be aligned together to make the media feel more cohesive, and the interface is easier to scan. Uh, text alignment also helps us keep the page legible and scannable at a glance so if you're just running your eyes through it you don't have to like look around trying to figure out where the actual copy is below the header so again on to number six now this is a selection option so you guys will pick out what selection format you guys think is the best a or b All right, I'll give you guys about five more seconds. Okay, so um, a majority of respondents picked B and you guys were correct. <laughs> so this follows the idea of Hicks law and this is basically an essential portion of um, user experience. Um, it states that the time and effort required to make a decision increases with the number and complexity of the options. So as we can see from option A, there are a lot of options kind of going into more detail, the various types of cars, where with option B, you kind of have the, four, the three main uh, car options with other selecting other ones. So this kind of revolves around the idea of radio buttons versus the drop down menu. Um, so with less than five options, you want to choose radio buttons and more than five options or that they could, or can be or categorized categorized options um, can be a drop down menu. So you guys did a great job on that one. And we'll go on to the next. So here's when we're picking ingredients, maybe for uh, what you have in your fridge at the time to, in order to find the best uh, recipes. All right, I'm gonna give you guys five more seconds. All righty. So this one also seems to be a little bit trickier. Uh, 
we have a but a majority of you guys did pick a which was correct and this revolves around the idea of toggle chips and this helps the user optimize their selection from a number of options um kind of going off of the previous idea of having multiple options kind of makes you feel overwhelmed and so by combining them all together and saving space and reducing the visual noise you are able to uh, have better tap targets for the consumer. Oh, sorry, I guess I didn't share the results. These are the results. <laughs> um, and then we can move on to the next one. So this is kind of about an account settings tab, whichever one you guys think is best, A or B. I'm going to give you guys uh, five more seconds. It's a tight race between the two. All righty. So, as we can see, it was very close with A being the leader. But if we go to the results, we will see that B is actually the correct answer. And this follows the idea of visual hierarchy and color. So this is a great example of balancing uh, both the hierarchy of the color and colors uh, to create a proper call to action. So a study found that human error causes 30% of data loss disasters. And this means that good user experience design can prevent these disasters from happening. Uh, well, whereas destructive action is related to calls to action that can cause data loss. So these should always be followed with a prompt to confirm the action as, uh, as permanent. So I know this seems like, oh, well, they're calling to action, the delete, uh, delete account button is red, but ideally you would not want your users to uh, delete their account. So by not calling to action to it, you kind of make it a little bit harder to find and therefore um, make people less obligated to hit the button. So oh, again, I keep forgetting to share the results, but these were the results again, really close. So good job to everyone, but especially the seven that got it right. So we'll move on to the next. And then this is sort of a uh, notification option, whatever notification you think would be most uh, is the best design. All right, we have five more seconds. Okay. So um, a majority of the respondents picked A. And if we go to the results, it looks like you guys are right. So it's important to pay attention to the context of the question to avoid confusion. The yes and no option really made uh, the option B um, kind of unclear about whether the user should skip typing, sign in manually, or get a sign in link mailed to them. Um, microcopy is the little text snippets that we see scattered throughout websites and apps that help you guide users and provide them with some much needed context. Um, these also deliver crucial bits of information. Um, so using direct and clear language is really important in buttons and microcopy text as it is important to avoid confusion. So we'll go on to the next. Three more left. You guys are doing great. Um, so which of these navigation bars do you believe is the easiest to use? A or B? All right, I'm gonna give you guys five more seconds. Okay, so a majority of you guys picked B and you would be correct if we go to the next slide. So as we can see from this navigation bar, um, 
the user interface design pattern is used so this, the visitors are not overwhelmed by a mess of data all on one page. So um, including a jump to the final or a jump to the first button is important to allow for better user flow, whether as let's say you for option A, I guess if you were on option two and you really wanted to get to option 16, which is at the very end, it would be really hard to just keep pressing that one arrow. So option B allows you the opportunity to skip right to the end which I think is nice and kind of avoids um, excess clicking. So we will go to the next question. And here is, this one's kind of tricky. So, as, so on the left side, we have the options bar and then on the right side, we have the options bar. So it's kind of tricky. I'm curious to see what you guys think. I'm gonna give you guys five more seconds. All righty. Oh, we have one more question coming in or one more answer. So I will share the results now. So again, really tight race, but uh, the winner was B. So let's see if you guys were right. Do a little drum roll, but. So it was option. Uh, B. So the hamburger menu is typically found in the upper right corner of the screen and the hamburger menu is basically the options bar that I was talking about. So one of the worst things you can do when designing an app is to overload users with choices and creating and cause creating this decision fatigue. So the hamburger menu helps keep everything tucked away and and kept neatly to the side. And studies have shown that click rates for hamburger menus are the, in the top left corner are very low where, where in the top right, they are high. So they can be on either side really, but they are most uh, successful on the right side. So now we'll go to our last question. So which one do you guys think is the most effective? And I, I'm, in case you guys can't see the difference, the uh, main characters' names are spaced a little bit farther below the movie title or the superhero title. I guess that's their um, secret identity. All righty, it seems like we have a majority of our respondents and almost everyone picked option B and you guys were correct. So this revolves around the idea of proximity. So uh, this kind of goes off of Gestalt's principles of proximity in which it is based on cognitive tendency to perceive the objects close to each other as related um, instead of whether you, would, you wouldn't associate objects far apart to be related. So using less vertical space between the title and the subtitle text together, um, allows the user to associate the two text snippets together subconsciously. So that is the end of the polling. Congrats, guys. You guys did an awesome job. And I will pass it back off to Shuby to talk about the psychology of color. Yeah, so thanks, Paris. So one thing that wasn't really picked up, I just want to go over really quickly from the examples was color psychology. So um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with like how movies use different colors. Here's like the Revenant and the Joker. They use colors in very different ways, especially in the Joker. There's a lot of bright colors. Um, and usually you think bright colors symbolize joy, but in the movie, if you've seen it or you know the stories, um, spoiler, but they actually, he's a very violent character and very dangerous. So they kind of do a play on the colors to create the superficial happiness and stuff. So and we know that in like movies, artists use these all the time. But a really interesting part is if you look at logos around you or um, notice different companies, they also tend to kind of uh, be grouped in different categories for color. So for large corporations, blue um, is a common color that's used. So uh, corporations like IBM, Facebook, Twitter, um, Chase, any banks and stuff, um, because this color is usually linked to like uh, stability, trust, security, intelligence, and reliability. So obviously like companies like this wanna kind of emulate these sentiments through these colors that they use. So a lot of blues and grays. And then a lot of food and beverage companies like Fanta or DoorDash um, or uh, Sunny, Reese's or like kids companies like Nickelodeon will use a lot of shades of orange and yellow in their branding to attract customers that um, can like recognize feelings of like fun or liveliness or kind of emulate feelings of hunger and stuff. 
So next time you see a logo, try to think of the colors that are used. And then we'll talk about some real world examples of bad design and good design. And so for the bad design part, um, bad design is honestly everywhere. We, you guys might notice it um, every day in your life. So there's some examples here. There's this newspaper that has these like social media icons. Seems kind of silly because you can't really click on the icons. They're just kind of there because it's a print ad. Um, I'm sure we've all struggled with like doors like this that don't have a label for which way to push. So you kind of have to kind of guess where the hinge is and where it opens. Uh, pedestrian countdowns, when you guys are walking to class, it might seem like, oh, you know, these are great, obviously, because it can reduce accidents. But um, there's been studies that actually show that they can actually increase accident accidents because a lot of motorists speed up when they see that they have a little bit of time left to cross the intersection. I'm sure pedestrians, we do that too all the way, all the time walking to class. Um, so yeah, kind of counterintuitive in a way. Ooh. One sec. Okay, so a really cool example that um, is brought up a lot is this butterfly ballot and how this Palm Beach uh, County, they had a ballot for voting uh, for the election and they made a really fatal error that actually looking back when they recalculated the votes, George Bush actually was declared the winner of the state and that presidency. And if they had correctly designed this ballot, George Bush would have actually lost the presidency and Al Gore would have won. So um, how this worked was it was a butterfly ballot and I'll show you guys in the next example, this is what a butterfly ballot looks like, but it's a punch ballot system. So it's a paper copy with a bunch of punch holes down the middle. And what they did was they listed the president candidates on one side and vice president on one side, and you have to kind of mash up the holes. And on this ballot, there was a space where they can mark their choices, but the row was misaligned with the candidate. So people thought that, um, you know, they're voting for George, or they're voting for Al Gore for the presidency, and they were actually voting for George Bush. And this was a lot of votes. So it's not like 10 or 20 votes. It was a 537 vote margin that ultimately changed the results of the presidency. And um, the design error was very simple, right? It's a misalignment of rows. Um, so after this, and because this error is found a lot in ballots, uh, designers often say like, when you're centering text on a page, you should try to avoid making um, the user's choices be centered on the center of the page because naturally our eyes are not uh, meant to like find information down the middle of the page. They're meant to find it from the left to the right. Um, so, that's something intuitive that they kind of missed in that uh, ballot. So I'll show you guys here. But so Al Gore is listed right here. So um, this is where Al Gore is listed. This is where George Bush is listed. So this is where people are supposed to vote for Al Gore, um, or sorry, down here in five. And this is where they voted for Al Gore. And that was a vote for George Bush. So um, it's confusing again, because these rows are not aligned at all with the columns. So actually this example became extremely famous um, for how to create better design. So there's a designer, uh, Marcia Lawson. She actually wrote a whole book about um, how to improve democracy using design. She used this example of the ballot error. There was also another um, similar example that happened in 2000 in Chicago where there was a ballot and they crammed all 73 candidates into 10 pages of this punch card hole. So imagine, going through this punch card ballot and there's literally 10 pages of them and you have to try to vote for everyone. And um, the candidates were extremely confused on how to vote. So she created, she basically redesigned this ballot. So she didn't abandon the idea of the punch hole. She wanted to hold that true to the design. She just used um, things like shading, uh, typography changes. She did different alignments. And so she used, again, she manipulated these simple elements of design to create a better form. So this is obviously a lot less confusing, I would say, and easier to find. So that's one example. So moving on from the ballot example, um, I wanted to talk about some websites that you guys might be pretty familiar with and um, some things that these websites use that might be successful or might not be successful. So um, Craigslist and Zara are both kind of known for using this concept of minimalism. So um, throughout the past decade or something, um, design has been going towards this idea of less is more. And a lot of ways when designers use that concept, um, it works and in some ways it doesn't. So 
Craigslist. Um, if you haven't been on Craigslist in a while, you should pull it up. It still looks like how it looks like in the screenshot. So it was launched 24 years ago and they have actually not changed anything on its user interface since it was launched. Um, there's uh, a few features that were added, but otherwise it's just a lot of kind of adverts that are listed in these columns. There's no colors, there's no images, there's no logo even. So when you open this site, you kind of just see this grid layout. And you know, traditionally you would say, you'd pull up this website and say like, this is really bad design. It doesn't look like how Facebook or Instagram looks or, Amazon looks at all, but um, for them, this has really worked because since they went into service on the internet, their design has not changed. Uh, Twitter and Facebook change their design interface every month, but Craigslist has used this kind of to their advantage. So they are still in the top 150 global sites in the world. They're top 20 in the US. So people are clearly still using this website. They're visiting it and revisiting it um, and they get 50 billion views in a month. So it's a lot of people using the site. Again, with no branding, they have no CSS, nothing fancy like that. Uh, the content is all user generated. So what, what is the reason behind this? Like what are the pros of this website? So from what you can see um, in any website, the more elements that a site has, the more things that can go wrong. So Craigslist has kind of created this super clean site with such few features that you can load this on any system almost instantly. There's no problems with loading things. There's no problems with the user finding something and clicking on something wrong just because there's such few features. And um, a lot of uh, this has played into for them like having better inclusivity and accessibility for the user. If you have no colors on the site except blue and white, um, people that are colorblind can use it very easily. That's not a problem. They only have text. So um, people that use voice services when they're accessing websites because they're not able to read the website, they can easily use this in any voice service because it's only text. There's no um, images. There's nothing that can abstract a voice speech to voice text. So that's great. Um, they have a click through menu so people can control this on PCs. They can go through it very quickly. So again, they've used all these to their examples. And it's one of the reasons why Craigslist is still so successful despite um, not updating their design at all. And Zara is kind of a great example of a very modern brand and website that doesn't really um, play into this less, less is more in a very favorable way. So if you've been on Zara, um, I get extremely frustrated every time I pull up Zara. I've never actually even browsed through it because I don't know how to shop on it. But um, their website has been criticized a lot for its bad design and poor user experience and poor uh, usability. So they are known, and I'll talk a little bit more about Zara. They're known to have this kind of weird marketing, clever marketing tactic, as you can see in the bottom right corner. So they have a very quirky way of like displaying their products to gain attention online. But because of this, they have also created a lot of confusion on their actual website, despite the brand itself being very successful to get people talking. So when you look at the website, aside from the brand, just the UX and the UI of it, there's very, um, it's very difficult to navigate to the website. You can see the hamburger, hamburger menu that's um, on the top left instead of top right is hiding a lot of the primary and secondary navigation that you need. So in order to even get somewhere, you have to click on that menu. It hides all the important buttons that you would need. Um, there's a lot of confusing product images that don't really match um, what they're selling. There's difficulty reading text and information. You can see right here, some of their text is all just the same size. So the title is the same size, the font uh, or the subtext is the same. And it just makes it hard for you to visually create a hierarchy when you're scanning the page. And bro browsing products in general is not very straightforward. So if you guys remember Jacob's Law, we talked about it is users prefer to um, shop and or not shop, view any websites such as shopping websites that are similar to the ones they already know. And Zara does not really fall into that category of websites like Amazon, eBay. And because it's so different, um, it makes it harder for people to come back and use their website properly. So similarly, um, I have an example here of cognitive overload when we have a opposite of like a minimalistic style when you have a lot of stuff on a page and you can successfully do that um, and manage it like Facebook does, or you can have a bunch of information on a page and not use design elements. And then it's not as successful um, as when you see on eBay. So uh, Facebook uh, is known to have a lot of different elements. When you pull up Facebook, there's 
like games, there's videos, there's photos, there's a bunch of different places for you to chat, but they've kind of uh, organized it in a very grid-like manner and that makes it easier for the users to find what they're looking for, despite um, how much information is on that page. So eBay, I would say that website has probably less elements than Facebook, but it still is not organized properly. So um, it's very inconsistent in the visual design and how they display the features. There's a lot, of, a lot of lengthy information that's kind of irrelevant to the user that only the seller needs to see. So a lot of their um, design doesn't match up. So again, there's a way for um, designers to display a lot of information in a good way as well. So really quickly, Snapchat, um, I'm sure you guys, well, at least if you agree with me, Snapchat has had a lot of redesign problems. So. If you see on this map here, something clearly happened in their update in 2018 where their impressions of positive impressions dropped drastically for Snapchat. And um, the 2018 redesign was like the big redesign when they created stories, incoming Snapchats, they created a friends page. They changed it, I'll pull up on the next slide. They changed it from this kind of layout to this really um, crowded layout that we kind of know now. And although this works for a lot of people now, this has made it harder for people to use Snapchat. Um, they have a lot of different features that I've listed here, like stories and how they've tried to combine it with different things. So, um, and the discover page has been a huge problem. So Snapchat is kind of known, um, they didn't really follow the rule that a lot of designers say, like if it isn't broken, don't fix it. So nothing in their interface before was broken. It was actually divided up very well for what it is. But they went from a very simple and effective interface to a very excessively developed, complicated and high tech interface. And so now you have to like swipe uh, left and right to find different things. There's a friends page, camera, discover page. They went from that to adding even more things like ads and stuff. So it looks very chaotic and cluttered and the users are not really accessing what parts they need to. Um, so there's a huge learning curve to Snapchat that wasn't there before. So that's a good example. And I'm really quickly gonna go over some good design examples because I wanna end it on a good note of some examples of good design that you might see um, that is contrary to some of the examples we've talked about before. So Instagram and Spotify, I think are great examples of good user interface. Instagram has really good visual hierarchy. They have a great navigation with the hamburger menu and the settings. Spotify is also known, um, I'll always be Spotify over Apple Music because of this, but they have really good behavioral consistency. Um, they make sure that the pop-ups always match and they uh, listen to user feedback and adjust their design accordingly. But um, the if, if you were to ask most designers, like what's a website that is extremely good, like the ideal example of really good UI, um, I would definitely say Airbnb. Um, they are really on trend with what design should look like. Actually, the font that you see here on the Airbnb website, they created that font, like the company created it just for Airbnb. That's how um, particular they are about their design. But they create a very clear and minimal interface, um, even though they have a lot of information. It doesn't seem overwhelming because of how they've designed it, but you can find a lot of information on that website. So they have a lot of visual cues. They use these cards that we talked about that help you group things um, and help the user kind of create, uh, delineate different um, parts of the website. So yeah, the UI cards are great. They make it very easy and very responsive for the user. So it's very easy for us to grasp. But um, I'll pass it on over to web design if you guys don't have any questions. But um, yeah, thanks for listening in. So the next part of the workshop, we're gonna talk uh, about how to apply these and you guys will be able to follow along and apply some, some of the stuff that you've learned about design elements and design psychology to create um, your own design. All right, thank you Shubi and Paris for the presentation and I hope everyone had an interesting time. And now we're gonna start um, in Figma so it's a um, online software that doesn't need to be downloaded. So if you don't have Figma, no worries at all. And we can take uh, five minutes to just open up Figma in a web browser and create your account if you don't already have one. Um, you can continue or um, sign up with your email.
And if you have any questions, feel free to um, drop in the chat. And I'll share my screen. Let me know if anyone has any troubles getting onto the Figma file. So while everyone is signing up and getting onto the file, let me explain a little bit about this workshop. So the first part of the workshop, we will be creating an intro card um, that you can then post on your social media after the event, if you would like. Um, and then the second part of the workshop, which will be led by Creel, um, we will be creating um, some screens of your choice um, uh, with some templates. Um, so yeah. So I'll get go ahead and get started with the workshop. So the first thing you can do is um, copy and paste the um, intro card under step one. And you can see some examples that we've made so far within our team underneath the instructions. So copy and paste um, step one. And pasting it anywhere on the screen is fine. And then after you've done that, you can upload a picture of a headshot. And, and then drag it into the circle, the white circle. So Figma is one of the uh, softwares that is most commonly used in UX design. And um, it's pretty simple to use just by clicking and dragging. And all the, uh, I guess, the how you want it to look can be changed on the right-hand side of the panel. So you can change the background um, to any color you would like. Feel free to uh, raise your hand in Zoom and let us know if you're facing any problem within Figma. Yeah, so for example, I just dragged a picture that I had on desktop onto Figma and I'm making it smaller and putting it into the circle. Yeah. Can... Um, let me know if you have, if you guys have any questions. Yeah, 
And you can also start um, changing the text by double clicking. Oh yes, so adding the image into the circle. So go to the sample intro card, click on like the top that says sample intro card and I'll highlight it onto the on the left panel section. And under that, you can click on the circle where it says Eclipse. And then I think I can add an image this way. One sec. One sec. For some reason that the mask group is over there, but should bring a mask right here. Okay, I can paint this one. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here, um, if you can click on the circle, bring any image that you want on the page. I'm just taking the summit's image. Resize it. Click on the click command on your keyboard. Select the, the image as well as the ellipse below. Right click it and there is an option within the right click options use as mask and it masks the image. So now you've masked your image within the circle. And if you're not able to do it, it's completely fine. You can just place your image at that place um, in the form of a square itself or however the image is shaped. Yes, I see somebody doing it. Good job. Okay, we're gonna give you five more minutes and then we can start with our uh, workshop of designing UI screens.
So I see uh, Anna has made her card here. I hope you can see my screen. So I'll take this card and if you want to put it on your story, just click on that card. On the right panel, scroll down, you will see an option of export. You click on export plus sign, however image you, size you want it to be. Export sample intro card. Yes, and you can save it anywhere into your computer. That way you can share it on social media that you've today learned the design of science psychology. I see two people working on their intro cards. I'm going to wait another minute and then we can start with our workshop. All right. So um, let's start with the workshop. I want to thank Yibe, Shubi, and Paris for giving us a really good session about the design psychology in different, different examples that they could possibly give us in print design, graphic design, UI design, as well as web design. Now, what's really important to really um, use those principles in real life. What everyone does right now, whenever you wanna order a food, whenever you want to get a cab, or you wanna book your flight, or even you just wanna listen to music, you always use your phone. And within your phones, you use multiple apps every hour of the day. Because design is so ingrained in our UI screens, it's important to know the psychology that we use beyond it. While Shubhi has explained us that, I'm going to give you one example that's going to show you how you can use these principles to design something. And for sure, I'm going to cover masking an image into a shape because that's very important whenever you design a screen. As you can see, this is the Figma software. I'll just go through two or three functions here that will be important for you. As you can see, there are pages on the left-hand side of the tab. Uh, currently, we're at the playground workshop page. Before this, you were at the intro cards page. So here you can navigate pages within a Figma file. There is on the top bar, the toolbar, there are four to five tools that are the most used tools for you. The, the tool currently selected right now is the move tool where you can use to move your screen from here to there. The second one is called the frame tool. It's in the shape of a frame and it's called region because it will decide a region that you want to create. So if I click on frame or even press F on my screen, I can just 
choose any size of a frame that I want to. I can click on it and I can reshape it as much as I want. Notice that when I use a new frame, there are different options on the right hand side panel of Figma, which shows me if I want to take an A4 sheet frame, a social media Instagram story frame, or even iPhone frames. Currently, we're going to design for iPhone frames. Another tool is the shape tool where you can use shapes like rectangle, you can shapes like ellipse. So let's say you've chosen a shape of ellipse and you want to change its color. You go to the right side of the panel, choose the color, whichever one that you want to and change it. Now, let's say you want to add an image to this color. I'll choose an image from our summit. I'll paste this image here. In any software, the functions for copying and pasting is Control C plus Control V on your laptop. So let's say this is the summit image that I want to put inside the ellipse. I put it above the ellipse. I, on the left hand side, there are the layers of ellipse as well as the image. I click command or control if you're using a Windows desktop. I press both of these layers, right click it and use the option of use as mask. It's masked inside the ellipse and I can change the size and position it properly. Another tool that's the most popular tool that we will use is the text tool. You can write any text here. Figma has many, many fonts for you to choose on the right hand side panel. You can choose any font that you want. You can change its size. You can change the line height too, as well as the kerning. There are many, only these three options creates a lot of difference in the way that you want to design any screen. So today I'm going to show you one screen that we have chosen to design using design psychology. The first screen is called a checkout screen for a flight booking app. Let's say you want to book a flight from Sydney to London. How do you do that? You go on a flight booking app. You select the trip, your uh, departure destination to arrival destination. You choose the time. You choose the airline. You choose the date that you want to go to. And whenever you choose all of that, at the end, you come to a checkout screen. Checkout screen is basically a place where you, whatever you have put inside your card, you are now going to pay for it. So basically you're checking out by payment. I'll take this screen for example. So here I'm taking a trip to London from Sydney. I have given the header name as trip to London because that is the context that I want to give my user whenever he's using the screen. So at the top, my header is my context. Then there is a card which gives me my ticket details. Notice that the card has symmetry. It has hierarchy. The boldness of the airport uh, codes is very different from the departure destination. That shows that whenever you want to go through airports, it's easier for you to recognize these codes than to remember long names of that destination. London has many, many airports so this code will be popular for one airport at the same time there is symmetry in this card from left to right it's easier to cross your eyes in and there are different different details in this card there is attention to detail how much time it will take uh, at what time you will depart and what time you will arrive these are the basic important elements that you would want in your ticket details the next part of the screen is is where you're checking out. That's why I, I have put it in under a white background because this is a transparent process. You don't want to be confused here. The, the, your ticket price is $780. You've chosen a payment method of a card. I've chosen the image of a debit card to signify it so that I'm reducing your cognitive load whenever you're looking at the screen. There are the details of your card that you can put in and your you can proceed to pay. 
notice that the colors in the card and the way these two cards are grouped together creates proximity. I know that the green card is talking about details without even reading at it. I know that the bottom card is talking about price or checking out without even reading at without even reading every detail of that card. So this kind of proximity is very important whenever you design a UI screen. Another example that I'm going to give you is designing a sign up screen for a giveaway. So let's say you're give away, giving away a mobile phone or giving away a bunch of options. Whatever information you want to take from your audience, you want to take their names, you want to take their phone numbers and email addresses. You've put an image to create interest. You've put a lot of negative space around that image so that people's focus is on that image. You've also given a time to enter the giveaway and you're winning AirPods through this giveaway. You're giving them correct and direct incentives whenever you're designing the screen. So it's very transparent for you. These fields are the same and it makes me feel that, okay, I have to type something here. There's similarity and it also creates proximity. The final button is so bright from the rest of the screen, I will definitely click on it. And I, here I've created emphasis through the color of the button. If you have any questions relating to this, these screens, please let me know, I would love to answer that. And moving on, We'll do a poll where we'll select a prompt that you would like to design amongst these three. And I've given some elements that you can just copy paste onto your screens and start designing. The most important elements that you would use in any UI screen is text, an image, a button, or even icons. These are your frames for iPhone 13 screen size, and you can start designing by entering the poll. I would ask um, Yibe or Nasir to start the poll so that we can know what people want to design today. Okay, people want to design a player screen. Okay, I see that people want to design a player screen. If you're having any trouble doing that, I can start designing for you, along with you. You can pick any board here and start designing. So, Notice the elements that you would like to design in your mobile music screen. The first thing that you would want to do is maybe select an album that you want to start playing, maybe a song, 
or maybe just an image of a person listening to music, something groovy. What also really helps whenever you're designing a screen is to just kind of structure it the first time you look at it. So maybe we can structure it through creating rectangles within your screen. Or creating dividers in your screen. Now that you've structured it, you can maybe start adding text or icons or any buttons that you would want to. I noticed that you're having trouble resizing the icons. What we can do is pick an icon, copy paste it, and whenever you wanna resize it in the same proportion, click shift on your keyboard and you can resize it as many times as you want and it will always be in the same proportion.
nice you guys are doing good we have about 10 minutes left and this file will always be with you you're welcome to come here use the elements and design your intro cards as well as your screens I see some good screens forming here. There's emphasis in this screen. Hey guys, as you guys are doing that, I'm gonna post the post evaluation link in the group chat. So you guys can go ahead and click that. It's just evaluation for our event. We also have a QR code within the file as well. If you want to make things easy, you can just scan the QR code and give us feedback there too.
All right, guys. So I think we're just about on time. So thanks for sticking around to do the workshop part. Um, again, the post eval link is on there, and then y'all can pull up the QR code. Um, but thanks so much for attending. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining, everyone. I really like that you made the effort of joining the workshop and get doing this. Yes, thank you. Alrighty, I'll stop the recording.